Hey, Barry. Hi, Anthony. Hello, Scott. Hello. So today we have uh, a guest speaker, a guest, uh, a guest, just a guest for the podcast. Uh, we got the chance because he was uh, the keynote speaker at uh, OpenConf uh, here in Athens. So welcome to Athens and welcome to OpenConf and welcome to Mikri Kuveda or Smalltalk. Uh, Scott, thank you for having me. Uh, it's really nice. Uh, so I think that we can uh, start with, uh, you know, a few words about your background, you know. Sure. Uh, just to get this started. So would you like to share a few things about uh, what you currently do and uh, a few things about the past? Yeah, so uh, so I think uh, the big thing is I was one of the co-founders of GitHub, which is you know a, a service that I think most software developers use, most open source is probably on these days. Certainly wasn't the case when we first started it, but mm-hmm. that that's I worked there for eight ish years. So yeah, we I I grew, helped grow the company from about uh, the four of us that were co founders to I left when we were about four hundred and fifty employees. Um, so it was uh, a relatively interesting, I think, growth story. And then hundred times more. Yeah, I, it's there's again every time every time a, a company doubles, it's a new company. So. I think I went through eight companies at, at GitHub probably at that time, um, and then uh, and then I left and I started a language learning company called Chatterbug, and I had me move to Berlin for that, and then uh, I left that, and now I'm starting a version control system uh, again called Git Butler, um, and and yeah, it's another startup. So like I'm just kind of I, I love starting startups. I love kind of being a I don't know serial entrepreneur, I guess, but but. Starting something, trying to put something out in the world, it's it's very, very interesting to me. So that's that's my my background in a nutshell, I suppose. So as uh, as GitHub grew, which um, which step did you find to be the mo- the most challenging to to follow and why? Uh, I suppose there are a couple. I mean the the uh, the beginning times I feel like were relatively difficult from a, a revenue standpoint because you know we weren't making that much and we were kind of bootstrapping the company and I left a job that I was making a good amount of money at as a professional developer and made maybe a quarter or something when I started GitHub and so I was struggling I think financially individually in the beginning and I think that was that was relatively difficult and then in the end I think. It, there was another sort of set of things, which was the company becomes so big, you don't know everybody in the company anymore. Like mm-hmm. once it goes past a hundred people or something like it's very, very difficult to know a hundred people relatively well. Um, and so I think anytime a company scales, like you get to a point where, I mean, we were hiring, you know, at the end of my time there, probably a dozen people every two weeks. Right. And so wow. it's like, I, that's the whole company for the first three years, you know, like every two weeks was was added onto the company. Mm. And a lot of them are remote. And so I, I struggled with that a little bit in just not knowing who the company was, right? Or not knowing who worked in the company anymore or, or you know, how to how to communicate with people in a human way. And so I think that was those were kind of the two. One was kind of more personal and the other was just just how do you how do you run something that's larger than you expected the company mm-hmm. to ever become. Um, so those those were probably the biggest struggles that that I struggled, and I ended up I think leaving GitHub in some degree because I did want to have this smaller, you know, more agile, more more hey, can we reinvent something from scratch type type company rather than you know I mean it was a thing on its way like it had its path it knew where it was going, um, and there's there's less kind of it's harder to change a moving ship at the, at that point so. Um, but yeah, I, I, every, every stage of it was interesting in different ways, I think, but those were probably the most challenging. So I just want one more thing. I I remember a quote from a friend from Antonis that we actually met in Berlin last year when we were there and he has worked in multi settings and in big companies. And he was saying that as a company grows and passes over a number of employees, it starts to look more like a town afterwards Mm -hmm. because you can't help but have very different personalities, very different people. And the dynamics are quite different. You, you can't have that same thing of, you know, coherency as you could for, is that true or? Yeah, no, 100%. Actually, uh, our our investors from Andreessen Horowitz, um, I, I think either either I think I think it was Mark at some point said, um, 
that once your 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 company culture is whatever 50% of your company thinks the company mm-hmm. culture is, right? And so you can try to set it as founders and say, okay, this is what the company culture is. Here's the company culture values. Everybody memorize these. Everybody kind of enable the like embody these these things. But at some point, if you're hiring 50% of the company, you know, in six months, right? After yes, the company's yeah. been around for five years, like it's very hard to say this is what the company culture is because really the company culture is probably whatever the last six months of hires were. Like, like it's what they think the, the company culture is. And we had, I think, a further, I don't know, advantage, disadvantage, complication, which was that we were like 50, 60% remote. And so we had a company culture that was remote and we had a company culture that was in the office and it was very hard to tell what do what is the amalgam of like what is the the combination of of all of the remote people think that the company culture is versus what are the people that you hang out with in the office think that it is versus like what's the whole company culture so I, I think we struggle with that a lot of of we had an idea of kind of what it was or what it should be or what we wanted to be. And then we'd we'd hire, you know, a hundred people in a couple months and be like, well, now, you know, that's half the company. So like we what is the zeitgeist really of of the whole company mm-hmm. now? And and I think it, I mean it's constantly, constantly difficult because as founders as well, people don't necessarily want to tell you this is what's wrong or this is what's bad or you know this is this is a problem that we're having, um, uh, unless there's secret channels or there's like different things or whatever, and it becomes very difficult to be sort of holistic on okay, this is what we want the company to be, this is what the company thinks it is, right? This is what we think the company should be. Like, how do you how do you and and you're not around face to face with half the company m- mm. most of the time, so. How do you make that whole? And and I think we we constantly constantly struggle with that. And I think any company that splits itself, I mean, any company that gets to that size does, right? Like like everybody, you can't know everybody in a five hundred person company. Like it's just it's impossible to be like this is what the company culture is. Like the company culture is whatever it organically becomes. And when you hire fast, then it changes faster than you can you can help mold it, I guess, into what you want it to be. Mm. Um, now you thought you were talking about remote. Um, now remote is something that you know is very well known and something that a lot of companies actually do. But uh, back then, because we're talking about uh, 12, 13 years ago, I think yeah. that's about the yeah. time that it was. Um, this was not the case, or at yeah. least it was not in Europe. No, no, if in the US it was uh, quite different. Uh, so from seeing like a remote culture back then, and then uh, was it something that you would like to? Did you continue doing that in the uh, companies afterwards, or? Uh, it's 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 a great question. So so I think GitHub and a handful of other companies at that time were kind of trying to pave the way and and make this be a thing that worked for them. So I I know Automatic, uh, uh, so WordPress, like Matt Mullenweg, like they they were trying to do this at the same time, and we kind of knew them, and we were kind of sharing notes with them. And there were a handful of other companies that were that were trying to be like, we want to be fully remote, or we want to be largely remote, or we want to make a remote culture work because there's so many upsides of having a remote company, right? And this this is, I think, I think really you can split it to before COVID and after COVID mm-hmm. because before COVID, it was really a choice. And after COVID, it became a necessity for everybody, whether they liked it or not, for at least a year. And then they had the, the chance or the choice, do we want to continue this or do we want to go back to mm-hmm. how we were operating before. But we made the choice before COVID, before we had to, to say, we want to enable some, we want to take advantage of some some parts of this. And some of the parts that were really valuable to us is that we knew people all over the world. We traveled all over. I spoke all over. We did conferences all over. And we knew people from all over the world. And we wanted to take the best people mm-hmm. in open source, the best people in Ruby, the best people in you know MySQL, the best people in whatever technologies we were using, find them and say, Hey, come work for us instead. You can work remotely, um, and it was a mixed bag because because we were a I think inventing the playbook as we went. There was not a lot of companies that did this, um, and certainly not a lot of companies at scale of hundreds or 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 you know several hundred or a thousand or whatever. Um, 
and almost no companies that did it really well. And so mm-hmm. if you look at any company that we're trying to do remote, they would they would really be doing kind of, it, it depends on the split that you have. If you have 90-10, right? If it's like 90% in the office and 10% remote, it's horrible for, for everybody involved, or, no. right? If it's, I, and we ended up doing it kind of on a team basis. So some teams were completely in the office. Some teams were completely co-located. Some teams were completely remote, but the teams that didn't work well, I think, or the teams that we had the most problems with were the ones that were split. So mm-hmm. you had 60%, in the office and, and 40% remote or, or something like that because then they'd have lunches or they'd have conversations or whatever At, or we'd we'd you know aqua hire a company or we'd, we'd hire some people that had never really worked remote and they liked the idea of it because they could make a nice San Francisco salary but you know work at home and in Wisconsin or whatever and like it was really difficult for them because they'd never done it before and the ones that I think worked well were ones that where they were contractors or they had done this sort of professionally for a long time and were like okay well now you're you're an employee but you're still kind of working the same way and they knew how to deal with that like they knew how to not be in an office with people they knew how to how to deal with imposter syndrome they knew how to deal with with you know not being around people that did what they do every day and have that kind of camaraderie or, or that community um, and so we had to invent all of that as we went and companies like us had to do that as we went and I gave talks and stuff on this how we deal with this how how it works how it doesn't work um, and then it was kind of funny when COVID hit because then we're, I was like, I, we've done this forever. Like, I know exactly how all this goes. And all these companies are just being forced into figuring all, all of this out from scratch. I think to go back to your, your original point of, of do I do it or do I not do it in, oh, in other startups is or not, yeah. I prefer not. Okay. I, I actually don't, I, I, I understand very fundamentally and very strongly all of the advantages of remote work and and all of the disadvantages and it, it really comes down to personal preference right mm-hmm. like like i like being in an office with people i like going into a room like we're in right now and having a conversation not doing this over zoom i much prefer doing this than doing this same type of thing over zoom even though it's really a similar conversation right but like i feel like it's much more visceral. It's much more interesting. Like, like yeah. we, we connect more or we have a different type of conversation. But I think it's the same in, in, uh, in a company where you want people in a room and you want them to whiteboard out stuff or you want to have a lunch and you want to have dumb ideas or you want to go for beers after work or like these are things you can't do over Zoom. It's, it's just, it's, you can try, but like it's not, it's not very easy to do. Um, and I think re- especially for an early company, especially for a pre product market fit company, like it's valuable to have these connections, mm-hmm. to have this empathy, right, between people that you don't get otherwise. Um, and, and when you're trying to figure out how to make your mark in the world. And, and we had that at GitHub, like actually we weren't remote until we were, I don't know, 10 people probably, right? Like everybody was in San Francisco and then we made sort of our our first remote hire and tried to figure, we were like, well, we're all kind of working remotely anyways. We were kind of working as an open source product anyways. Um, and so we're communicating over Slack, we're communicating over GitHub. Like we, why not hire somebody that's not in the office? Like we're all sitting in the office, not talking to each other 90% of the time anyways, but it's that 10% that makes a big difference. And and so I think when you're really young and you're you're a really young company and you want to find your mark in the world, I think having people in the same place and being able to go out for for, you know, dinner or beer or whatever after after work, I think it's invaluable. And and so uh, Chatter the the company that I started after that was a language learning company called Chatterbug that was in Berlin. Almost everybody was co-located in the new company. Git Butler is a version control system. We're trying to we're trying to rethink version control right from from first principles from grounds up. And and it's I think it's invaluable to have somebody in the same to have everybody in the same room and say let's think about this every day. Like what is working, what's not working, how can we iterate on this? It's so much faster. It's so much more visceral. And and so. I think for an early company, personally, it's not that it's not doable. I know people that do it, but I think, you know, it, sorry, I, I feel like I'm talking a really long no, time no, on no, this, but, you <laughs> but, but I feel like, I feel like it should be for an early company, it should be one or the other. Mm-hmm. Like either you're a fully remote company and everyone's remote and you're a hundred percent invest in that and you invest in the infrastructure and you invest in everything that makes people feel comfortable in sharing ideas and and coming up with concepts and iterating on work um 
in an interesting way and maybe get them together, you know, once a quarter, or whatever, in a house somewhere and, and, you know, have a nice, have, have a nice week together and, and do sort of, this is kind of what we did is like, we would have these houses or whatever that everybody would be like, okay, it's one week intense. And then everybody goes heads down for, for uh, three months. And then you go one week intense and it kind of goes back and forth. You have to have that, I think, or you're a hundred percent in person and you hire everybody in one city and you make sure that everybody can get into the office. They don't have to come into the office every day, but they need to be able to get into the office. Mm -hmm. If you're like, you know what? We got to do a strategy session on Tuesday. Let's get everybody in. We'll wipe it. We'll fucking figure it out, right? Sorry, can Wait, I smile? No, no, yes, yeah. of course. <laughs> <laughs> you are more than allowed. The, the, the Greek version is quite vulgar. So, <laughs> so this is actually, this is very interesting because it's what we do at our company this particular week. So we are a remote company as well. We're five people. Four of us are in in Athens. We didn't used to be because the one person was in Thessaloniki. It's in northern Greece. Yeah. And we have another person in Nigeria as well. So this is a week that we, we do this two times per year. We get together for a week and we work all day from the office and we do have a dinner one day or a party another. And it's quite intense compared to the rest, yeah. but it's um, extremely valuable to us. I mean, this yeah. is uh, this it, is the last day of a company meeting. It, it, there are pluses and minuses on both sides of this, and I, I, you, I just, I would, I would recommend if somebody's listening and they're trying to figure this out to just choose one or the other, right? Like to not to not do 60-40 or, or 50-50 or whatever. Like don't have an, an office culture and a remote culture that you're trying to merge I, and trying to keep people. It's it's just impossible. It's the worst the, of both worlds. Like everybody's in office or everyone's remote. Like, like it's the easiest to choose one or the other and to go <clears throat> whole hog into that and be like, how do we optimize for this rather than how do we kind of make this work? Because if it's 50-50, then people... People lose out on conversations. People lose out on context, and people in the office don't know that they're that they're keeping the remote people, people out of context. They just don't. They're not aware of it. And then the people that are remote are jealous of it, or or they're like, "Oh, you're you're keeping me out on purpose," or like, "There's already these things that kick in when you're not around everybody all the time that only exacerbate." Anyways, so I just I would. My my advice really would be choose one or the other and go entirely into that and don't make exceptions when you're young, right? When you're under 20 people or 15 people or something. And then after that, then it's fine. The, the company naturally bifurcates after that anyways, right? Like you start having departments and you start having teams and then each team can choose. That that was like, like we talk about GitHub. I talk about GitHub as being 60% remote, but really every team in it for the most part, was 100% local or 100% remote. Mm -hmm. Like, overall, the company was this percentage, right? Remote or local or whatever. But, like, team by team, I think, for the most part, like, we really went into everybody needs to be in one place or everyone needs to be remote. Mm -hmm. Like, we're not mixing these teams, but it's on the team to decide kind of what kind of team do they want to be. And then these are the kind of the rules to make sure that that team works well. That was uh, actually, I think that's uh, quite interesting, and it's, so, it's not something that we hear a lot because you see companies either being like fully remote or companies being uh, in the office, and now we have this rotation where you know you have to be two days in the office. Yeah, which I, I mean, I, I personally disagree, but that's like a personal opinion. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, my opinion on that as well is is I guess I mean we kind of went into this like hub model, right? Where it was like you need to you need to work within. A, a radius of the office mm -hmm. where you can get in it, you know, on Definitely. notice, right? Um, I, I don't know that it's valuable to be like, okay, you need to be in three days a week and then you can re work from... Like, like I mean, at GitHub, the early days, we were all in San Francisco and most of us worked from home most of the time, mm -hmm. right? It wasn't that we... We didn't even have an office for years. Like, it wasn't that we needed to. It was that we would be like, hey, are you guys working from the cafe today? And then we go to some cafe and we'd all kind of sit there and, you know, buy coffees and kind of work there together. But like, it was it was the camaraderie or the 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 just being able to have random conversations about stuff. And, and I feel like there's still a, a big value in that. Or, yeah, again, you're 100% remote. But like, I... I I think it's weird to put rules around if everybody's in the same in the same city or something like then yes everybody like like structure your company so that people can work from home whenever they want to because then you get a lot of those benefits right like you can take your kids to school you can set your own schedule like you can hire a, a wider range of of people because they have different you know different things on their lives that they have to be able to work around and the more flexibility 
then obviously that's great or have core hours or whatever. But like, really, it's like, okay, here's the meetings for the week. Mm -hmm. We'd like them to be in person, make it. And then everything outside of that, you know, make your decisions, right? Like you're an adult, like it's, it's <laughs> get the, get, get your work done, right? Like it doesn't, it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter when you do it or how you do it. It's, it's, but when we want to have all six of us in a room together, like get Let's in a room. be able to do so. Yeah. So I wanted to ask another question about remote, but not this time about working. Yeah. But both in GitHub, in um, Chatterbug and in Git Butler, you have your, your customers are all around the planet. Yeah. So how, how do you approach this, this audience? Is it important to get in close to, to your, to your potential customers? Mm. I mean, mm. go and have a physical presence, do presentations, or you can do all of this online. So, so, I mean, I think it, it's a great question. I think it really depends, right? Like, so the, so GitHub and GitHub are both software developer audiences, right? I'm really I'm really building a tool for an audience that's very much like me. And so to some degree I'm my own customer and I can dog food it and I I know very specifically kind of what I think I think I'm an average developer. I actually don't think I'm a very good developer. <laughs> But I think that's actually a strong point of mine in that when I write a book on Git or something, I'm not writing it as the smartest person. I'm writing it as an average <laughs> an averagely smart person that struggled with it and is trying to help explain it to people that are coming after them, right? Um and and when I'm writing software development tools, we're not trying to write it for the smartest people, right? The people who wrote Git are trying to write it for the smartest people. The right people who wrote GitHub are trying to write it for the average, like, like just people who don't want to deal with the most complicated tool set in the world, right? Like, and I, and I feel like there's a huge amount of value in that, of just taking things off people's plates so they don't have to worry about that. They don't have to put a lot of their mental effort into that, that they can worry about other harder, more difficult, more specific problems, and they don't have to worry about version control. Whereas if you're a Linux kernel developer and you want to send patches to the mailing list, like you have to deal with a lot of Git bullshit that is like, now that's taking mental space to, to figure that out. And your whole team has to do that, right? Um, and there's a big, big overhead, overhead to that. Um, so I, shoot, I'm sorry. I forgot what the original question so was. I was, I was talking about how dumb I was and then I forgot <laughs> what my train of thought was. And that, now was I, a, that was amazing. So the, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> that was black man. So the, the question, the original question <laughs> was how do, Uh, is it important to get close to your clients and physical oh, yes. to your customers? Yes, that's right. <laughs> so, so again, it depends on the on the on the audience. So, so for the language learning thing, I think it really was because uh, we started in in the states, and people in the states don't need to learn another language. And it was a language learning company, and so <laughs> there's people in California can can use Duolingo for two years and be like, I'm learning this language, great, and never have to speak the language to anybody. And then they think they they've learned the language, and they're like, fantastic. If you never actually have to do it in practice then just believe that you it know spanish work. now right like <laughs> like fuck why not right like it doesn't really matter but there's no there's no stakes to that but in europe yeah if you live in germany and you're trying to learn german right or if if you live in spain you're trying to learn spanish like you have to use it every day you struggle with it every day and so we wanted to be close to our customers i wanted to to be to spend more time in germany i want to learn german because i need to struggle with it every day like i need to feel if you're if you're writing an app or whatever that try, tries to help people run marathons you need to try running a marathon all the time mm -hmm. right like it needs to be the struggle of yours all the time so you were dog, dog fooding again you have to dog food all the time i i if it's possible right i mean if you're doing some big b2 B thing that's that's writing software for industrial systems or whatever, then it's really hard to dog food your shit. But like, if you're writing software development tools, if you're writing a consumer product, like you should be using if 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 you're using a language learning company tool where the CEO of the language of 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 you know whatever it is of Duolingo or Babel or whatever isn't trying to learn a language with their thing all the time and and use then don't use it. It's useless, right? Like they everybody in that company should be using that. Everybody in the company should be trying to do that. And at GitHub, we were doing that all the time. Our lawyers were using GitHub, right? Like, like every HR was using GitHub. Everybody was using. We were all using GitHub all the time. 
And we were constantly, constantly dog fooding it. And we had hundreds of repo- like, and everybody in Git Butler is using Git Butler. Like th- this is, this is, you have to dog food your product. It, you have to feel the pain if you can. Like if you're in the incredibly uh, wonderful position of being able to be your own customer, right? Of being in the, in the customer space. Not everybody is. Like I happen to have been in three startups that all I could be the, I could be the customer, right? Like I started a language learning company because I was trying to learn a language and I was struggling with it. And so I felt that pain and I wanted to to come up with something better. I, you know, I started Git Butler because I've been using Git for 15 years and I feel like it hasn't progressed. It's it's Mm -hmm. barely different than it was 15 years ago. And there's nothing that's challenging it. And I think that that's kind of stupid. Like it's not perfect, right? And so why has nobody rethought this and thought like, well, how do we want to be working? What tool set would be good for, for a software developer? And I am a software developer. So like, I want to be in that, in that mindset of let's question all of our tools and figure out how do we make this part of my, my life better, right? Um, and so I think it is, it is really important to, to be near your customers if you are your customer. Actually, this was, sorry, I'm kind of on a, a side shoot again, but like this was actually the problem with GitHub is that GitHub was always good for GitHub, right? Mm -hmm. Because we were, it it was so close to this. Like we were open source software developers. We built something for people like us, which were small time open source software developers. We weren't good for Linux. We weren't good for, for, you know, Git project. We weren't good for uh, the Apache projects. Like there are a ton of stuff that couldn't move to us because they were like any huge open source project. They were like, your tooling is not good for, for us. Your tooling is good if you have, you know, a hundred people using it, right? Or or if mm-hmm. twenty people contributing to it. Not if you have a thousand people contributing to it. That's it's not a good tool for that. And from a business, because actually one of the weird things that we did is that we had open source projects and corporate projects that were both using it, which very few version control systems really had at the time. Like corporate projects where you use Perforce or use these sort of, you know, clear, yeah. clear yeah. case, yeah. clear case or TFS. And open source would use Subversion and CVS. And like they were really aimed at different audiences. And we tried to make one tool set for, for both systems, which had never really happened before um, in, 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 at, at scale. And so, like, we came in and we just, we built stuff that was good for us. It was good for us what we were doing in open source. It was good for us what we were doing in in sort of corporate, you know, like building github.com as a private project. Um, and as we got, so, like, the tooling was good for a 20-person team when we were 20 people, and it was good for a 100-person team when we were 100 people, and it was good for a 500-person team when we were 500 people. And every time we, we grew, we we're like, oh, yeah, that is actually, okay. like, like we would get feedback from enterprise customers or whatever that's like, oh, we need, you know, like, in 2FA, or, or we need single sign-on, yeah. or we need, you know, whatever, said, integrations. Why do they need that? And we're like, <laughs> oh, you're, you're stupid, right? Like, like, we're like, that's a dumb way to work. And the, But, like, over time, we're like, oh, yeah, like, like you get to that size. And so I feel like we were really kind of con- constrained to some degree. And the only thing that made us better at that is going to conferences like this, going, like, you know, sponsoring beers or whatever, going, meeting open source developers and saying, like, actually, beers are the best. Because okay. beers, I mean, you know this this sort of uh, Latin phrase in vino veritas, right? Like, like in wine, there's truth. Like, if you if you okay. get if you get people to 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 drink to drop a little, their defenses, to drop, drop the their defenses, then they because people are like, I love GitHub. GitHub's the gr- best. And then you give them a couple of beers, and they're like, you know what sucks about GitHub? Sure. And you're like, this is this is what I'm here for. This is the the content I'm here for. And and they would tell you what they didn't like about it, what didn't work for them, right? And like, so I think in the end of the day. You do need to be close to your customer. Like you do need to talk to your customer, but you need to get them to be honest with you, which is hard to do sometimes, especially if you have a good product that people like because they want to tell you how it's good and they don't want to tell you how it sucks. Um, and and yeah, we had a lot of feedback from open source developers at at points where we would go to conferences and they'd tell us we needed to hear it three or four or five times and be like, okay, this seems to be a pattern. Maybe we need we're not we're not feeling this this internally we're not feeling this in our open source products but we see people who are and so how do we address this in a mm-hmm. way that we can identify with and that's very very hard to do right like like you need to figure out how do you have communication channels to who feels this pain and know 
yeah, I'm relieving this pain in a way that we're not being like, it's not relieving our pain, but it's relieving somebody else's and we can have this communication channel open. And that's, it's very, very hard to do, right? Like it's hard to know you're solving someone's problem if it's not your problem or if you're, you're not your own customer. Um, and so I'm, I'm actually, I'm constantly interested in how to do that because there's just, depending on the, the, the market that you're in, there's so many different personas, right? There's so many different types of, of users of these things. Uh, language learning was awful because there were, there were people like the Americans who don't give a shit, like that, that don't never, never really need to use it. And then there's people who found themselves plopped in the middle of Germany and need to speak German, like Mm -hmm. fluently, like in weeks, right? Or in months. And, and you're like, how this just, and have, some have money, some have don't, don't have money. Like how, how, like what, what are you targeting? Right. It's, it's very, it's very difficult. Um, but yeah, I, I, if, if you can be your own customer, that's the best. If you can't, then yeah, you have to set up these communication yeah. channels. So, um, in, in a previous life with Paris, we did an online ID like uh, code spaces before code spaces. Yeah. Uh, so, um, we we had the, the same virtue of you know being our own customer and all those things, but uh, what we what we found out was that this was also like a big a uh, big trap because uh, if you think that you know whatever whatever is in your in your mind is the truth about your customers, then maybe you you're not heading to the right direction. So how do you how do you try to avoid that situation where you something that you believe it's it's a nice feature might not be a nice feature for your main audience. So I think I think actually a really really good so Chatterbug did not work out very well. Mm-hmm. Um it 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 grew, it has a thousand customers has like a million M, uh, ARR or something. Like it's it's not a it's not a it it has worked. It has lots of customers. It runs. We've kind of uh, moved it over to to somebody else to run as more of a lifestyle business because we could just couldn't run it to to this massive scale that that we needed it to be. Um, and so I, I think actually it is a good example of, of how, like for me, it was a lesson I learned from that is how to pay attention if you are the customer or if you feel you're the customer to pay attention to what doesn't work for you rather than trying, if you're a founder or if you're a founding team, or if you're working on something, I think it's very easy to have doubts or to have things that you know don't work and you kind of ignore them. Right. Mm -hmm. And you're like, people can work around it. People can figure it out, but that that any friction point, anything that bugs you, especially as a founder, especially as somebody working on the core product, right? If you're if you're the target customer and you're having problems with it, like I think it's very easy to try to ignore it and be mm-hmm. like everybody else will ignore it, as opposed to paying attention to it and be like, this is the core problem, right? If I'm having problems with this, it's going to be a huge problem for somebody that doesn't care, right? Like that isn't, isn't invested in this. And for Chatterbug, what it was, was it was, I didn't like showing up for in-person. It was, it was like a face-to-face video thing and I'd get nervous and everybody would get nervous and people wouldn't want to. And it was a relief to cancel a meeting, right? Okay. Because it's just hard to talk in another language with somebody that you're not you're not good at talk at speaking in that language. And so if it's a relief to not use the product, yep. right? Like, but I really ignored that because I knew it's like, like I said, it's like a mar- it's like learning how to run a marathon, right? It's a relief if you don't have to go for a run on a Saturday for for three hours. Like it's nice, right, to to hurt your ankle or whatever, and be like, oh, thank God, I don't have to do this run. <laughs> yeah. And like, but if that's your the, the core of your product is that people don't fundamentally want to do it, they just want the output, right? But like, I was ignoring that to some degree and being like, it's like a marathon. People want the output. They'll like, we just have to get people who care enough about it. But that's that's not how you build a big business, right? Like, mm-hmm. and and I was really really ignoring that. I think in a fundamental way that that was that was problematic. Um, and I'm trying to be better about that now and i think we didn't ever really have that problem at github like people were it was there was just a complete void in the space at the time that we started and so we really lucked out and i didn't learn really how to grow a business Mm -hmm. we just learned how to manage a growing business right which is a a little bit of a different thing like we had a rocket ship that we had to learn how to how to handle as opposed to how to build a rocket ship which is a completely different thing um and so, so yeah, I, I now I think I'm more cognizant of that, of like what, what bugs me and just don't ignore it, right? Mm-hmm. Like make sure 
this this should this is not a problem and really constantly it's it's hard it's hard to constantly do that right and to, to loop back and be like let's say i'm a baby on this and i this is the first time i've used this product what's going to frustrate me and how do i get rid of that and and it's a it's a, a discipline that, that that's difficult to pay mm-hmm. attention to and if you've built a thing, it's embarrassing to pay attention to because then now you have to know this thing I built you and thought up. was a good idea is frustrating me. And I know I'm the best user of this, right? Like, and that's and, true yeah. because you have all the context, the whole context yeah. of how this is building, you know, the whole thing. So I wanted to ask, I think, so what's, what was bugging you with Git and you decided? To build Git Butler. Everything bothers me about Git. I mean, if we really <laughs> want to go into this, we we. I mean, this is so. How how Git Butler started is that I had a, a, a an angel investing uh, firm with my partner, and so we would we would invest in companies, and we invested in twenty or thirty companies, probably at angel levels, and and just in in founders or concepts that we really liked. And so one of the ones was a version control system. And, you know, I've been in, at GitHub. And so I was like, I'm interested. In, but I've, I've always been fascinated by version control. Like I know, well, actually, one of the things I really like is, is to get to know my competitors, right? Like I want to be best friends with my competitors in, in everything. So I like, I know the Atlassian guys. I know the Babel guys from the language learning things. I know the Duolingo guys. Like I, 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 I just want to know who's running. Like we all have similar problems. We're all in similar spaces. Like we're competing, we're, we're competing but like it's still it's fascinating to be friends with people that that with you know that that are in the same space as you um and and i i we invested in this in this version control system um and it was trying to do more of a google docs for version control like mm-hmm. like live streaming changes right like to mm-hmm. a central server so you don't have to do commits you don't have to do checkpoints you don't have to sort of like branching and merging in the same way it's just it's more google docs it's just streaming everything you can see what everybody in your team's doing and i think the downside was that you kind of had to it was a its own standalone version control system so you had to have everybody greenfield it right like you had to have a new pro like it was you couldn't come into an existing git project and really be using it and github struggled with this as well because we come into companies that were using perforce or using Clearcase or tfs or whatever and we'd be like hey use git and they're like well we can't switch one developer over to git like there's none of that tooling we have to come up with a new project and then everybody has to try out Git in mm-hmm. GitHub yep. and we know it because of open source or whatever. And so it was a struggle for us, right? Like to, to get companies onto this. And so I was like, well, if we really look at Git, if we really look at version control of about, you know, what is, what do we like? What are we trying to do? What is it good or bad at? Like Git hasn't changed in 15 years, right? It and it was Git Suites now. <laughs> and it was it was written for Linux kernel developers sending mailing lists to or patches to mailing lists, right? Like it's it's not like it we've we've really kind of bastardized it into what we have now with with branches and stuff, which was really second order. Like they wanted to to build these emails that they could form and send a mailing list. And the whole tool set is really fundamentally built around that. And everything else is is kind of bastardized. And and you know, I've written whole books on this and <laughs> literally three now, probably like, like major things of trying to document this and make sense of it for people because you're trying to move a mindset from what it was written to, to what people want to use it for. Um, and, and I think GitHub became popular to some degree by making it accessible, but like it's, it's, it's a good tool, but it's not built for how we write software. And so it became that plus this, this other version control that, that Kirill had written, I, I, and that we had invested in and wasn't really working out. Um, we, I was like, there has to be something here. Like it, it's, a, it's an interesting idea. How has version control not changed? And, and if you really look at it, it hasn't changed in 15 years because now everybody's using Git. Um, and it's really set, like when I was, when I was going out on stages like this and pitching Git to people that were using TFS and Clearcase and Subversion, CVS and Darks and fucking, you know, Mercurial and everything. Like I was trying to tell people, hey, look at this awesome version control system you've never used. And this is what the, be- now I go into things and I, I give talks on stage. Everyone uses Git. Like there's no, nobody here that doesn't use Git, right? Like, like it is, it is That's really, true. it is really a per- permeated sort of the software development world. But I mean, if you look back to how you fundamentally used 
CVS or or Subversion or or RCS or anything, right? You're running git log, you're, or you're running a log command, you're running a diff command, you're running merges, you're running branches. Like it's very very similar, right? Like like most of the stuff at a fundamental level. Like yes, this is easier. It's merge before uh, commit or commit before merge, or you know you can do like sort of re-enter merge, whatever. Like there's there's lots of things that it's it's better at here and there but nobody's really rethought it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, can it be more like Google Docs? Like at a fundamental level, like why are we doing commits rather than it saving everything all the time? Why why are we on one branch at a time rather than having multiple branches that that can kind of be co-located? Co co like we can work on two or three or four branches at the same time without it having being, uh, to be a problem. How, why can we not do, uh, if there's gonna be a merge conflict, why can we not mer work on the merge conflict resolution together like before the fact, rather than the first person that merges wins and the second person that merges has a hundred percent of the work, right? Like, wh why do I not know that you and I working on two different branches remotely have merge conflicts before the merge conflict happens three days later, right? Like, mm -hmm. why is there no, we're using a central s system. They, like we're both pushing our code to GitHub. Like, well, why do I not know as soon as I'm typing on something that you're already working on an active branch that conflicts with mine? There's so many things that we spend so much time on and nobody's really rethought any of this space in a long time or tried to figure out what do we, how do we really want to be working? Um, like Google Docs is a good example of you never run, you know, Google Docs commit, right? Like you're mm -hmm. not safe, but it saves all of your changes. Like, why don't we have some, some daemon that's running, that's just saving our changes all the time in, in whatever project that we're working on. So we never lose anything. It doesn't matter what command we run, right? Like how often do you lose work in Git, right? Like it's not all the time, but when it happens, it sucks and it does happen. And so I, I, I guess, sorry, this is the longest possible answer to this. I, I apologize, but, but I, I find it really interesting to, I found it really interesting, I think at the time to look at Git and be like, let's just tear all this down. Be like, if we started version control from scratch, but it still needed to work within a sort of GitHub world, like what does the client look like? Like, what does it look like locally? Mm -hmm. Like, what do you want a version control system to do? Um, and there's a thousand ideas. Like there's so much that can that can be done if you're not if you're not basing what you're doing off of what Git has done for 15 years. And you're like, how do I really want to work? And and what do I value in in a system that helps me save work and collaborate and document? Right, which is really what a version control system does. Um, like actually, I mean, just from that perspective. Like think about git commit, right? Like git commit really does three different things that 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 are completely orthogonal. Like you're you're using git commit to save work in progress because if you don't commit, it doesn't save it. And so you'll do like work in progress, some bullshit, and you're not really like the 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 message isn't really documenting it. It's just saving your work. You do git commit so you can share the work. So you could because you can't push it anywhere unless you commit it. So you have to commit something. And so you're like, okay, here's some stuff just so I can push it on GitHub so somebody can look at it, right? And so there's that. And then there's documentation, which is, you know, I'm writing a commit message that really documents the work that I'm doing. And so like, why not separate those into three different tools that, that one is like, just save the work. One is I want to share the work. And the other is I want to document the work. Um, and, and we're just used to this, right? Like you just don't question the things that you've used for a really, really long time. And, and I, I, I find that fascinating. Like I just, there's so, so much interesting stuff that can be done around how do we write code and how do we work together? Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's endlessly fascinating to me. So I, I remember, um, one of the most frustrating uh, times that I was writing code and lost work with Git, with Git. So I was working on a project of a client and, um, the project was created by another person and they had uh, set up Git hooks. So pre-commit hooks. Yeah. So I couldn't commit my work if. Um, it wouldn't pass some sort of LinkedIn or for marketing. I don't remember. And because I've just started working on this project, um, I didn't have the appropriate node version on my computer. I don't remember something like that. So I was postponing the time I would commit my work because it wouldn't let me, I was trying to commit yeah. because it would break <clears throat> and I wanted to do some progress. It would, it would work when I would run the program, but it wouldn't work when I tried to commit because it would run another anyway command. So somehow I lost my work because I was postponing yeah. the, the time that I would commit because I wasn't able to do this because of, of that. And I was thinking, I, I would really have hoped for, um, for me to be able to 
to decouple checkpointing my work and actually packaging it to share with the rest. Um, that that was that was quite frustrating. I, I remember that. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I, it's, it's one of the things that I find really fascinating, right? Is, is what, what are we really trying to do? Like, what, what do we want to be doing as we're working? Because most of us, we're software developers. We just want to work on software. We don't want to do branch, branch management. We don't want to do, we actually, most of us really don't want to do review, which is kind of fascinating. One of the things that, that we're working on, I mean, we're a young company, right? We're trying to kind of spitball things, but like, one of the things I find fascinating, the more that I look at it, is the review process, because most people hate reviewing, because reviewing is really difficult. And one of the reasons why it's really difficult is because GitHub, it, it, partially it's GitHub's fault. So partially it's my fault, <laughs> if you really think about it. But like, because we do review on per branch basis. <clears throat> and so then people try to do stack branches or whatever. And stack branches are really just, it's the same as reviewing individual commits, right? It's just the not having to re rewrite the commits. You So, so each branch is really then a commit because there there's a dependency between them and so it's like what's the difference between like a stack branch and like three commits that you can just it's just that you can't review a commit you can only review the unified diff of the whole branch um and so uh and and the other problem with with reviews is that you can't make them very rich you have a description in one tab and then you have the unified diff in another and then you can go and like adding commit or adding comments and then they kind of go into the other tab right and and so it's kind of separated whereas uh, so i'm i'm working on a thing right now which is is kind of like a like a branch notebook like a jupyter notebook mm -hmm. where you have like the diffs and you can you can rearrange them into whatever order because the other thing is like you you'll look at at a you know a file and then a test and they'll be at completely opposite ends of the unified diff right yeah. like one's at the top of the thing and one's at the total bottom and they're they're like they should be next to each other and there should be a description that says this what uh, this is what i'm trying to do here and then they're calling this and then there's another section with another you know rich text or some images or whatever like it should be a document that's like read through this and some some of the diffs are are squashed because it doesn't really matter right it's like entries into a toml file or whatever and you're like i'm just adding some dependent like review it if you want but like who gives a shit like no, that's not really important what's important is the logic in the things that it depends on right um or like a log file or, you or lock files right like like yeah pnpm shit right like <laughs> it, it, it whatever it is like you should be able to say this is important look at this this is not important or this is for front-end developers this is for back-end developer like you know i need a typescript review on these things and i need rust review on these things right like whatever it is but like i feel like we should have way more control over how to how to write up the <laughs> The like code changes that we're making to make it easy as possible for the reviewer. So they're, write, they're reading a story and then looking at the code changes. And it can, maybe it's line by line or maybe it's in like, you know, side by side or like maybe it's compressed or like you can, you can kind of add comments here and like you don't have to put code comments in the like you can just add them after the fact and the, like there's so much cool shit we can do to make it easy on the reviewer to read a story about here's what I'm trying to do with this branch, right? And you're like, okay, that all looks good, or here's my comments, or, or whatever. Um, and so I'm excited about stuff like that, of of just just looking at how we've been working for ten years and being like, does it, like is this the best way to do this, or like what are the things that are frustrating to people that that you know you skip, right? Like you know that if somebody sends you a PR and it is thirty files and a thousand lines, that you're not you're not going line by line right and really no, putting the story together no you're like way. yeah it looks good to me like but that shouldn't be it right like you should be able to kind of put this together how you wrote it right and if the if the version control system is recording sort of crdts of like line by line how this happened like i can help you say here's the order in which you you grouped files or you edited files like i can help you tell the story you can use ai to be like you know, tell a little story about like, why do you think that they did this in this order in this manner? Or what were they trying to accomplish? Right? Like we can do it back. I, I don't know. There's lots and lots of interesting things. I, I don't have all the answers, But like, I feel like what's interesting is asking the questions of, of what what doesn't work, right? And what do we take for granted? Because we've just been using it for a long time, and there's nothing better. And so we're like, ah, it's fine. Like, this is just how it works, right? I think I think figuring out how you get frustrated, and and how you'd like to work, like what would be ideal? Right in in being able to collaborate with people, like I would love just to go back to the the merge conflict thing. Like none of us had merge conflicts before 
distributed version control systems in in the same way. I mean, CVS and stuff, but you would you you couldn't commit until you merged at that point, right? And so you would have a massive merge conflict that would be really horrible. And you're like, well, never mind, right? Like if you're in CVS and and Git made that a little bit better, but like it's it off puts it to when you want to contribute. You can contribute all the time and feel like, oh, I'm I I have no problems. And you're just you're buying happiness from the future, right? You're like you're <laughs> like this is just going to be a problem days from now, rather than when I want to save my work, which is what it used to be. But if you merge first, but if you merge <laughs> first, then you're fine, right? Like, like this is this is, but like nobody's tried to solve that problem, and it's 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 totally solvable, right? Like like there are ways to, I think, like what if what if you guys saw that you were having merge conflicts and you could see what it was and you could work on the conflict resolution and then it didn't Before. matter beforehand and you could agree on it beforehand and then it didn't matter which branch was merged first because the second one would just automatically have the conflict resolution you've already agreed upon and had a conversation about and had like figured out this is what we want it to be if they're both merged. If one or the other is merged, then then we can throw it away, right? Like it's it's it it. I I I like the idea of trying to figure out how do we get around these things that are constantly frustrating. So so this can be very so this this can be very useful, especially if you are working on database stuff. Because let's say you're working in in front end development. So okay, what's the worst case scenario? You're gonna spend a lot of time that um, you need to rearrange code. If for example, we are using um, Django when we write backend in our applications. So Django produces migrations for the database when yeah. you change the models and all that stuff. Uh, I guess in Rails is, mm -hmm. is in a similar situation. Yeah. The thing there is that when you have conflicts in that level, you have even more implications than just having different code. You might need to drop your database or uh, locally or you know do more weird workflows. And if you can catch this, the, the actually the earlier that you can resolve this it's it can be much much easier i was actually talking with um a person from another company here and was saying me that this is one of the worst problems they have in their company because they're a big company they're they're working with django and if three or four people work on migrations that change the same model at the same time and one asks for the other person to review their work while they only or already have a branch that did migrations on their own computer they just cannot review it so let's say you have you have a model and you you remove a field from that model this in django will create an automated file that makes the database migration so you have run this migration you have applied it in the database locally so you have the, the new schema and uh, let's say I or Antonis are working on on changing this model in another way than you. And I have a problem. And I say to you, hey, can you please help me with this thing? I can't get this working. Can you please check out my branch locally? Yeah. And you check out my code, but it's um, it's not consistent with the database that you have created. Yeah, yeah. I have actually then. <clears throat> So, so, so the I feel like that's almost a separate problem, which is which is the problem of having version databases. Like mm -hmm. there's there's there are, like you can do I think with Neon or or like um, there, there's a couple of of like Postgres databases where you can have version databases um, where you can According say to branches. Yeah, okay. so you have like a database per branch, right? And you can you can switch back and forth between them or something. Oh, that's because in the in the end, so so I mean, there's another like there's lots of other. A sort of problems with software development, <laughs> software development. <laughs> like that, any dependencies that you have, right? Like, like you know, Redis or or Postgres or or um, with us, we have we have Git repositories that we have to sort of have in the back. It's hard to test some of this stuff, right? Without sort of all these data structures in place. Um, but I think what is interesting is trying to figure out, okay, as, like if you can version your database or if you could do rollbacks and restores in a, in a useful way, then yes, you can switch branches. Or if you can merge them and have, what will this look like when it gets to production? Mm -hmm. And let's make sure that these two branches work together beforehand, but still have the, the capability of being able to merge them in any order, right? Like that, that is interesting. Like, I think a lot of, a lot of, Companies like um, Facebook and Google and stuff are trying to go more towards monorepos and more towards um, uh, sort of single line uh, History. histories, right? Where where everything's like stacked stacked reviews or 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 you know bisectable or something like that. 
And I think it's interesting. People ask me this a lot of like merger rebase, right? And and I I think it doesn't really matter, right? What what matters is does your tool set work well with however your your history is. I I think that mergers are better because it has more history and you can just do sort of a single parent and essentially get the same thing as if you'd squash merged everything. It doesn't really matter. So you can still do bisects and stuff, but but in the end, what you want is the tool set that you that you use, the the things that you're trying to get out of your code history. It works with whatever your your database looks like, what, whatever your your code data get get history or something looks like. Um, and so, I what I'd like to move towards, I suppose, is having a little like I I feel like it was almost a mis man. I don't want to say a mistake, the, but but. One of the problems that I see a lot now is that GitHub will allow you to merge, rebase, or squash merge a PR, and everybody, every team chooses a different thing. And so now there's all these opinions on kind of how to 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 deal with that data data set that that mm -hmm. comes out of that after after the fact. Um, and I think it would be better to have, I guess, come up with a tool set that works well under one very specific circumstance, right? And not not give people the choice to to really have these different sort of ways that they can that they can do stuff. I I but mostly because it's just it's it's the tooling, right? Like it's the tooling. Like what are you trying to do with this that that becomes important at that point? Well, I, I think that uh, when you reduce uh, the available options, then you create uh, better workflows. But uh, I mean, Git started with you know, you, sky's the limit. You can do everything you want, and then you have GitHub where you you have a main branch, and then you do PRs or you know, you, you put some structure into it, and then slowly you can put something like on top of it. So in GitHub you had like hundred options, now you have like fifty. So mm -hmm. what what are the correct fifty options? And maybe after you know. 10 or 15 years with um, working this way because this like a new paradigm, then you can start thinking of uh, how you can move towards uh, a solution that works for 80% of the people with uh, a great way. Yeah, I mean, I think actually, I think the problem, sorry, to go, I, I guess we're, we're talking about the same thing, but I think the problem is, somebody was was telling me recently that the problem is, is that the, the pull request is really the first order interesting object right like it's like the auto like it, it, it really shouldn't matter every commit in between that's kind of not how we're treating it so they're like oh you can squash merge and then the pull request is sort of the the atomic unit right mm -hmm. like like then every commit is essentially a squashed pull request because you're not doing you're not pushing directly stuff to master um or you don't merge and then just the merge commits are sort of the atomic thing because that's the pull request if you rebase you're losing all of that actually mm -hmm. rebasing i think is the worst option of these it does create a linear history but you're losing so but you're losing the data in the pull request which really ends up being like what the the patch series used to be mm -hmm. right like what the commit message used to be it's it's the pull request for a github centered workflow is the important information like each individual commit is like essentially not interesting anymore w because you're not you're not re-rolling re series right you're not re-rolling a branch you're not doing you're not doing review on a per commit basis and so then people have to do stack diffs and stuff to kind of get around that because they want the pull request to be the atomic unit of work um, and and I think it should be like I I think I think that really that kind of what that that is what commits used to be in in the mailing list sort of sort of workflow and that's what pull requests have come away from a little bit because people don't want to re-roll and force push and there's just too much git work around that right um, and so I think that's where we'll go right is that there's there's this this idea of some trunk right some trunk based development or something and people will have something like a pull request right where it's like here's a proposal for a unit of work and you're like here's some review and you can chunk it up to some degree and you can describe it and then you can review it and then you can update it in an easy way and then when it's all done you merge it in as kind of one atomic mm -hmm. unit of work and like that's where we want to go we're all we're just not quite there right like like we're all working around the, what we want this model to be in various ways um and i think it it'll be interesting to see kind of what what the collaboration workflow looks like in in a couple of years. So the idea would be like you start streaming to your open PR, and then it doesn't yeah. matter where you commit. And yeah. then at some point you have this atomic unit, which is the PR. Then you and you document it at the end, right? Yeah. Or or it documents it, or you document it over time. How nice would it be actually 
to start working and to open up commits and start putting work into commits before they're committed and start describing them and start mm -hmm. documenting them. And then you just at the very end, you're like, okay, now this is done. And it kind of codifies right everything, for. right? Like you can't, you can't do that. Like you have to wait until the very, like shift left on all this stuff, right? Like you have to wait until the very end to do any of this work. And it's very frustrating for people, I think, because you're not in that mind space anymore. I think, I think that um, every, every team reinvents, reinvents the wheel in to find a way to do so. So what, for example, what we usually do is um, we open up a draft pull request, and then we just send commits as we work, and we update the description yeah. as, the moves, as this moves on. And then w when we have moved to a place where we mm, we try to make as meaningful meaningful descriptions as we can, um, we were actually having this discussion the other day that descriptions should also be useful for the person that will review the pull request, which is a, a work in progress as long as this is in draft. Yeah. And when this is ready, you we mark this as ready for review. So this is the our own way that we have invented inside the company yeah. to do something to me sounds close to what you are describing. So I guess every company tries to find a way to checkpoint their work, you yeah. know, keep some sort of notes and and indeed it would help a lot if all of us had a common language around, you know, sounds like a common need to me. Yeah, no, I think I think the main thing is that software developers are you get into a flow and you know what you're doing and you have all everything in your head and you want to describe what you're doing when you're doing it to some degree. You want to be in that flow and say, okay, here's what I'm doing and then you do it or you do it and then you say, here's what I'm doing. You don't want to do stuff for three days and then go back and remember mm -hmm. what it was you were doing and try to take the time to put it together and to document it and to write commit messages and to describe it to somebody and open the pull request and write the description. Like, like I feel like what, what would be nice is to wait, is to, is to, to shift all the way to when you're writing the code and let, give you the tools to describe it at that time. What's your mindset? What are you trying to do? How are you writing this? What, what are you trying to accomplish? Right? Like, and the tools aren't there for that right now. You have to work around the tools that we have. You have to work around Git and GitHub and what they allow you to do. And, and if you want to do something complicated, then you have to do more and more complicated things in Git that become more and more dangerous. And then you have to get everyone on your team to be able to do that as well, which becomes an exponential problem. And I think the answer is just to let developers do what they want to do when they want to do it, right? Which is not really what the tool set allows right now. And so, yeah, I mean, part of it, yeah, I have this company and we're trying to solve that to some degree. Maybe we'll nail it. Maybe we'll completely fail, but I think somebody will at some point, right? Like I think I think this is not how we're going to write code forever. We're, we'll we'll shift into I'm documenting as I'm writing it some way or another because that's the headspace I'm in, and that's how I describe it to somebody, and that's how I communicate to somebody who wants to look at it or wants to review it or wants to understand it how how to do this thing. And and also if you if you think about it, it's also a bit easy when you want to go back to the code because uh, currently. Um, after you know doing the PR, doing the review, merging the PR, this is just code in your repository, and the, all this information is lost. So <clears throat> somehow persisting that metadata that you somehow, I mean, you put into the review, you you do the work of yeah. uh, documenting, of doing all that stuff, and now you lose everything. So maybe that metadata can live alongside the code. Yeah, somehow I mean, and ideally, ideally, I think we would we would have version control tools or documentation tools or something that would be able to pull in sources that had more context like it'd be mm -hmm. how nice would it be if it, you had a s slack bot that was in your engineering channel and took all the conversations that you guys had in slack about code or all the conversations you had in github about code or about issues or whatever that were related to this thing mm -hmm. and you were working on a function you're like tell me a story like tell me how this function came to be right and it was like oh no problem it started with this issue because of the century thing that you know we were getting errors and then scott took it over and he like wrote it in this way and he had these conversations with Kareel, and like they figured out that the best way to solve this would be this and then that's why it turns out to be this way right like that that context is there right like it's most of that's online like it's there there are artifacts for that but like we don't have access to any of that data unless we go through for an hour and dig it all up and so i think llms help with this type of thing like it'd be really nice to feed all of this into into a, a company llm or something and be like just describe this function to me and it's like okay well here's you know now it's the senior developer that has all the context in the world and can be like yeah this is issue 72 
<coughs> and they worked on this and they argued over this and this is what the output was and it's causing these errors in Sentry, right? Like, like that type of thing would be amazing, but like, and we have all the data, it's just, it's not accessible. Now today, usually it's like, I have no fucking idea why this came to be and... Yeah, you just edit like, it <laughs> and create new problems <laughs> yeah. and it's fine. So th this is, um, <laughs> this is, for me, I run into situations like this more often than, than I'd like because I'm, you know, you pinpoint the problem, you try to, through git blame, to go back to where this thing was, and then you, I, there are multiple times where I run into a commit that has all tons of unrelated work because it was like, it was work accumulated through right. lots of time. And I, I really don't know what that person had in mind when they wrote this particular piece of code. Yeah. Because there's uh, Python code changes, documentation changes, Docker file changes, JavaScript changes, CSS changes that have been accumulated for that much time without any checkpoints and the ability to document. And yeah. um, yeah. super important. So what, what much you more ab about Git? But what's the one thing that you wish? One thing? Oh, yeah. Man. That is a great question. Or what is the or one what's your thing? Or what's your favorite feature of Git Butler? You can say, you can... Well, so, so right now we, we, we have the thing called virtual branches where you can, you can be on one, more than one branch at a time. Like one central thing about every version control system, I think, is that you're, on, you're always on one branch, right? Mm -hmm. like, okay. And so Git has this, this, the head and the index, and you're, it's always one, one branch that you're working on. And we came up with this interesting thing, which was I can be working on a feature branch and then see a bug and then fix the bug and just drag it into branch B, mm, right? Yeah. And commit it as though it was the only thing and push it up and get it integrated, but I don't have to take it out of my working directory. Like right now, you have to be like, okay, well, I'll either stash everything I'm doing and fix the bug and push it up or just commit it into my feature branch and just assume that they're, now they're just, they're not really related, but like I saw it when I was doing this and I don't want to switch context, right? And I like the idea, it's actually very valuable to me to not have to care what context I'm in, to just be like, okay, I'm working on this thing. I see something else. I'll move into another context, but like I can be in both of them at the same time, or I can pull down your remote branch and I can apply it simultaneously and see what it looks like when, if it was merged with mine, right, with my work in progress or something, and I don't have to switch context. And I think switching context <clears throat> is why Git has been powerful is because it's easy. It's it's easy at doing that. But I feel like what the question that hasn't been answered is what if we didn't have to switch context, right? Like what if we could have multiple contexts? What if there are layers in Photoshop or something, right? I can be in all these contexts and I can choose which ones I want to have at the same time. And to traditionally do that, you have to create merges and then maybe undo merges or something, right? But like to get it into your working directory, you have to no, do a merge. Nice. And so like I like I actually I've, I've really enjoyed working with the Git Butler client in the last couple months of just I don't have to do a lot of branch management, right? It creates a branch when I don't have one and I start doing work and it sees that. Like it's saving work for me all the time. I don't have to do work in progress commits. I, If I start working in another context, I just create another context and just have the work start going into that. Um, I can commit it and push it completely separately, right? Like I, I don't have to choose which branch I'm in at a time. I Like we're young and this is, but this is what I love using in the, in the alpha that we're doing right now. Um, but I think in the future, there's just so many things that we deal with all the time that we don't think about that much. And when it's off your plate, it's it's fantastic. You can go back. Yeah, I mean, it's it's frustrating, right? It's frustrating to 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 not have that that tool set in your arsenal. So the idea of Git butter is like porcelain for Git porcelain. Yes. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, I mean, it's interesting because if you think about it, like Git is really, it's really five different tools, right? Mm -hmm. that, that do different, completely orthogonal things. The only thing they really all have in common is a centralized database, right? Like there's just this database of commits and this directed graph of snapshots. And Git log works on it, and Git blame works on it, and Git commit, you know, adds to it, and Git push, you know, moves it. But like, they, they, they could all be different tools. Like you don't, you don't really need them to all be in one tool set. They just, it's like Postgres that there's an ORM and there's a BI tool or something, mm -hmm. right? Like they use the same yeah. data set, but like they do very, very different things. Um, and, and so we're just trying to look at each one and be like, what would be a better thing for this, right? What is a better way of getting data out of this? Or what is a better way of getting data into this? Like, how do you really want to be working? And I find that, I find that fun to just think about Git as a database and figure out what is, what is the, 
not a porcelain on the porcelain, but just, you know, what's a completely new porcelain mm-hmm. that, you know, shits the same shit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean so the, the idea of Git Butter is to to work on, on top of Git, so you still use the same database, but... Uh, yeah, the not- push... The push is the same, the database is the same, but we can write it however we want to write it. We can, yeah. we can formulate the data however we want to put it together. Um, but yeah. So I had another question. Yeah. What is the feature of Git that you believe more people should know about? Uh, so there's a two, I think, recently that I've been, I've been talking about at conferences um, because I feel like people, it's very valuable. They're very valuable and almost nobody knows about them. Um, one is something called re re re, which is reuse uh, recorded resolution. So there's a git config setting that you can say re 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 git config r e r e r e dot enable true, and if you're doing rebasing and you solve a merge conflict, it will remember left side and right side and what the conflict resolution was, and if it sees it again, it will reuse the okay. the existing wow. so you don't have to if you like if you've ever had the same merge conflict twice then you're wasting your time you can make git remember that and reuse it again um so that's that's very useful if you're doing rebasing the other is uh git blame has some really nice features that should probably be um default one is dash lowercase w which is ignore white spaces so if mm-hmm. somebody went in and changed all the tabs to spaces or something Dash. Why does GitHub not have this on my know. fault? <laughs> uh, it's my fault, too, because I wrote the initial Im- implementation to Git Blame, and I don't think it's been touched a lot since then, because not that many people use, I think, the GitHub Blame implementation. But like even in VS Code or whatever, I don't think it uses these, these options. Um, so dash lowercase w ignores white spaces. And then there's dash capital C, which looks for code movement. So if you copy a function and then move it to another place in the file, it will not see you as the as the author, it'll see whoever originally wrote those oh. lines as the author. But interestingly, sorry, we can end uh, pretty soon here. <coughs> if you do, keep talking if you do dash dash capital C once, it looks for code movement within a file. Dash capital C twice, it looks for code movement within a commit. So you can copy it from one file to another file. And it and if you blame that second file, it will show you the edits from the first file. It'll show you the person who originally wrote those wow. lines. Or, orig- or touch them last before the move. It won't look at the movement, right? It'll ignore the movement. And if you do cap dash capital C three times, so this is git blame dash W dash capital C dash capital C dash capital C all in the command line, then the third one will look across commits. So you can delete a function in one commit and then add it into a different file in a second commit and it will see that movement and it will uh, attribute it to the original author, right? So wow, okay. you can make it, it's more expensive, like it takes more CPU this is to what do I was this. About yeah, to it's more expensive, which sure. is why it doesn't do it um, by default, I think. But it's not that expensive. Like, okay. like none of this stuff is really that bad unless you have a goodness. massive code base. But like, just make it, you know, a Git alias or something of like Git really blame and dash, <laughs> dash, dash lowercase w dash capital C three times and be like, okay, like really try to figure out who wrote. Like who last really touched this in a meaningful way, and mm-hmm. and so that's that's that, those are the two things I think people should know more about. Yeah, I think um, that's very useful. Actually, I, I didn't know I knew dust w, but not dust c. Yeah, and many times you you find out they have a function and then it has been moved and then it shit. So it's the same. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would not just bother, you know, trying to find out what's happening there. Yeah, so. but I mean, yeah, you really think about it. Like, how nice would it be to just be in your editor and on those lines and be like tell me a story about this function, right? Like, that's what we want. Like, get, like, get blame in its best is still heuristic, right? It's still not, and it's still the last person that touched the line. It's not really, who came up with this? Who, mm-hmm. who was the product manager? Who, what was the use case? Like, like that, there's, there's more valuable context, I think, around that, that, that we're missing and get, we'll never solve, right? Because it will never really have that data. And so there has to be something that's built up that, that has access to the data and can answer that in an interesting way. Sounds good. I mean, it's like storytelling for Git commits. Yeah. Cool. I think yeah. that's uh, like a, I feel that's like a nice point to uh, start wrapping <laughs> up. I mean, we can continue as much as we want, but uh, I no, think I think we, we got a party coming up. I know. Yep. No, we'll have to, we'll have to go get some drinks. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, um, it was amazing for me at least. Uh, that was yeah, uh, for me a really nice conversation, and uh, it was too. a great chance to have you here. So wrapping up, uh, we have a section where you can. Uh, Propose things from products, books, you know, whatever you want. Uh, you can either go first or last. Depends on you, whatever you want. 
Uh, yeah, you want it's to good. start? Or, uh, it's a good. It's a good question. Um, I I would say, I mean, from a product perspective, obviously, I would say if you're if you're willing to to join the Git Butler Alpha and and help us test out some of this stuff, uh, we're a little bit early, but like everything works, and we've been using it for a couple months. Um, you can go to gitbutler.com and sign up with the mailing list, or you can go to our Discord and just ask me, mm-hmm. and I'll I'll immediately give you access to it. Um, we just kind of want to kind of screen for you know people that that are interested in the community, um, and then yeah. So from from a product perspective, um, the the let's see what's another interesting product. Uh, I feel like I had something the other day, and then from a book perspective, I would say this is not this is not a business book. This is just I love sci-fi. Oh, nice. And I read uh, uh, a book that I really liked recently called Children of Time. Um, so mm-hmm. if I had one recommendation, it's about spiders in space. Uh, <laughs> so a little bit weird, but it is a fantastic sci-fi book that was one of the last ones that I read and I really enjoyed. So I'll uh, I'll go Child- Children of Time. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, buddy, any okay proposals? Yeah, I'll go next. I um, I proposed a podcast last na- last time. I'll do this again. So there's a podcast called Be Changelog, which is about open source software and all sorts of different stuff that I find super interesting. The last episode was about um, a v- virtual machine management tool that um, you can run on Ubuntu that runs very small, tiny virtual machines, which cool. I don't remember the name, but I found it super interesting. So yeah. That's my take. I think Changelog actually is a combination of different podcasts and they, they have selection or something. It might be. Anyway. anyway. Uh, so I will do like the, the simplest stuff. I would propose uh, GitHub Flow. Uh, I believe that like that's the best way to work when it comes to PRs and uh, that comes down. I think that today's podcast is very related to that. So. <laughs> uh, sounds good. So yeah, I mean, uh, thanks a lot, Scott, for being here with us. Uh, it was our pleasure. Uh, hopefully we'll meet again uh, sometime soon. And yeah. Thank you for having me. I really, I really enjoyed it. And thank you for uh, picking me up in the rain. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I mean, it's not very common to have rain nothing. So it was, it was one of the hard days, you know, but we figured it out. It's fine. I appreciate uh, it. Thank you for having cool. me. And uh, thanks for listening. And uh, yeah. yeah, see yep. you next time. Bye. Cheers. <laughs>